Uh, hi, my name is David Holman. Uh, I work at Sandy National Labs, um, and uh, I've been participating in the C++ uh, Standards Committee for some time now. I'm going to talk about the ongoing saga of C++ executors. Um, it's been quite a journey trying to get uh, executors into uh, C++, so um, I'll bring you along for the ride, hopefully. Uh, I, my slides are available online. Um, I am going to jump through a few code snippets, sometimes maybe a little faster than you may like. So uh, feel, if you have a laptop with you, feel free to pull up the slides and follow along. Um, and uh, yeah, or if you're watching on YouTube, pull up the slides, follow along. Um, so outline. Well, this is where I'd normally put an, an outline of this talk. Uh, but uh, I'm trying to tell a story. I don't want to spoil the ending. Um, also, maybe I was a little lazy and didn't want to do an outline. Uh, but the, there's a spoiler. Uh, computers are complicated and generic programming is hard. Um, okay, a few disclaimers here. Uh, nothing in this talk represents an official position of the Standards Committee, and uh, all of our official positions are always uh, in numbered documents that we vote on in plenary. Um, and uh, nothing here is meant to be a criticism of our processes or members or anything like that. Um, and if anything, it's just trying to show that we're, we're, we're pretty thorough. Um, and I'm not trying to represent anyone that's been involved in this. There's a ton of companies and ton of people that have been involved in this process over the years. Um, most of the quotes are pretty accurate, but several are a little bit approximate, especially word of mouth quotes that aren't written down anywhere. The essence should still factually apply. OK, uh, so what is an executor? Well, Wikipedia helpfully tells me that it is uh, someone who carries something out, such as the administration of an estate. And it's also a, a fictional starship in the Star Wars universe and a Brazilian thrash metal band. So um, I will be talking about something other than a Brazilian thrash metal band today. Um, so the idea is behind executors is pretty simple. You have an algorithm that doesn't run on a specific set of resources or doesn't run on a specific hardware. It just runs uh, wherever you, you call it. And you give it uh, an executor. And now it magically runs on anywhere that you can express in the executor concept. Well, that um, may sound easy. Um, it's not. <laughs> um, so it, it, the, beyond that, the general idea is that you have some sort of execute method or something like that. Maybe the executor, some, in some frameworks, the executors are callable. In some frameworks, executors have a um, in queue method or something like that, uh, and you, when you're passing down to a to a, an executor aware algorithm, you just pass through. When you need to run work that is part of your main algorithm, you're just going to instead of running it directly in the calling context, you're going to run it on the uh, executor. So that's the, that's the basic idea behind executors. Um, shouldn't seem doesn't seem too complex. Um, so, uh, wow, that's actually a different font. It's more fun with uh, uh, JavaScript. OK. Um, so uh, several papers have described executors over the years. Um, executors are objects that can execute units of work packaged as function objects. Um, an executor is to function execution as an allocator is to allocation. Um, an executor is an object responsible for creating execution agents on which work is performed um, and abstracting the mechanisms for launching work. So these were three early papers on executors and how they defined executors in their introduction. Um, so there's a long history of executors uh, going back to long before we had p-numbered papers even. Um, so Google had several proposals. Uh, Chris Kohlhoff and uh, Networking TS uh, team had some proposals. Uh, NVIDIA had some proposals. Uh, I'm going to walk through kind of very briefly uh, the different um, essences of those proposals. And uh, all of these were focused on different use cases. So keep in mind where they're coming from. Keep in mind uh, um, as you look at them, 
what the differences are and, and try and think about like where that might, what, what that, how that might arise. So the, the very first, this is way back in 2012, the first executor proposal came out of uh, Google. Uh, the, uh, in their proposal, executors were derived from an abstract base class uh, with pure virtual functions for all of the, the possible uh, methods. Uh, timed execution was a first class concern, so they had an execute, uh, they had an add at and an add after. Um, all of their uh, methods were possibly blocking, um, so the, the work could have been executed in line no matter what, um, except for triad, which would check to make sure there was room in the queue, and if it didn't have room in the queue, it would just return false rather than, so, so there was no actual way to say, you know, defer this execution no matter what. Um, so, so it was um, focused on more around a thread pool type model. Um, here's a quote from the paper. Inheritance, uh, the interface was based on inheritance polymorphism be basically because they uh, said that the, the overhead of that should be pretty negligible, um, uh, which is interesting given kind of the modern direction of executors. Um, the networking TS uh, used templates rather than inheritance, so a little bit more modern in that respect. It had these uh, three different uh, methods, uh, oh, it introduced this um, distinction between executors and the underlying context. So this is the first time we actually see an executor kind of being described as a handle to an execution context rather than the context itself. So in, in Chris Kohlhoff's proposal here, um, the execution, the thread pool was an execution context and then an executor was something that was able to submit to a thread pool, right? And there were different aspects of the ways you could submit to a thread pool. Go ahead. Yeah, all of those things, yes. Oh. Yes. Um, yeah, the, the question was, are these executors considered to execute on the host, or can they execute on a different host or on a different device? Yes, all of those things. Um, yeah, I'll take another question. I am going to, I do have a lot of slides. I was 80 minutes in my practice walkthrough uh, without any interruptions, and I added about 10 slides, which was a bad idea. But I will try and take questions. I suspect my answer will be, you, you'll see. But go ahead. Yeah. No, absolutely not. <laughs> uh, this is like seven-ish generations removed from the current proposal. So. Uh, that's maybe a little bit of an exaggeration, but not far. Um, and and the, the, diff the, the methods in the networking TS proposal differed in their blocking behavior, right? So, so the um, blocking and non-blocking is a really important uh, aspect of, uh, of executors for networking. And so the, the, this use case really focused on, okay, can I guarantee that this thing will block or not block or make forward progress independent of me? Things like that. Um, so... Uh, yeah, this is a quote from the paper itself uh, the, about the operations dispatch, post, and defer, and they, they all differ in, which, in the eagerness with which they run relative to the submitted function, uh, relative to the calling context. Um, NVIDIA came in uh, 2015 with a proposal um, that had this emphasis on bulk execution. If you've ever programmed in CUDA, this will make a lot of sense. Um, and uh, they restructured things a little bit to make this executor traits customization point rather than the allo uh, analogous allocator traits. Um, they uh, had executor categories, um, of sequential, parallel, vectorizable, um, and uh, the, they, their focus was on executors being consistent with this broad range of execution semantics and with with cooperative fibers, with GPU threads, with SIMD vector units, all of the possible ways you can execute a function. So we had these three proposals progressing, and uh, finally, uh, SG1, that's the uh, study group one, the, uh, the parallelism concurrency study group on the, on the standards committee. Uh, in the 2015 Kona meeting, they said, uh, please unify these things. Uh, so here's a Here's a rough timeline of what's going on. The Google paper started way back in 2012. Uh, the NVIDIA paper was uh, 2015, and Chris Kohlhoff's paper was also uh, around that time. Uh, and so, yeah, um, 
The authors of this, the, the various papers began weekly teleconferences. Um, spoiler alert, we're still doing them. Uh, after about a year uh, of uh, meeting for two hours every Friday, uh, a proposal was drafted for the November 2016 meeting in Issaquah. Uh, so yeah, um, I'm going to pick up the story in a little bit, but let's talk a little bit about why it's so hard to do this. I mean, the first thing people think when they see this, they say, well, it's a function object, you have to run it. So why should the API be any more complicated than std invoke? And that would be really nice, but that's not really how all of the trade-offs work. So let's talk, let's talk first about how uh, the difference between parallelism and concurrency. Who can say that they are confident they could define the, the difference between parallelism and concurrency off the top of their head? Alistair, I'm very glad you, you can. <laughs> Um, given how much of the standard you've written. Um, I would, there, yeah, not many people can, and this is a really important thing to be able to understand. We certainly have had presentations to SG1 where people have mixed these things up. So, um, so this is, by example, um, somewhat hand wavy, this is concurrency. Uh, if you have some variable accessible to both, uh, both workers, um, and one of them is trying to load the variable, and the other one is um, trying to store something. Uh, this program, by the standard, is not guaranteed to ever print hello. I'm being a little hand wavy here because there's a there's a yield here that's I'm kind of being hand wavy about. But uh, unless these workers have a concurrent forward progress guarantee, so um, Generally speaking, concurrency is a, is a thing that imposes extra requirements on the compiler and on the runtime system and the OS scheduler. Um, so C++ uh, std thread uh, instances are concurrent agents of execution. Uh, they make concurrent forward progress. Parallelism, on the other hand, is, is actually the complete opposite of the spectrum, which is why it bugs many of us so, uh, so much when people mix the two of them up. This program, if, these, if worker A and worker B are running in parallel, uh, this program can result in x equals 1 or x equals 2, or uh, it can run uh, x equals anything. That's a little bit of an ugly corner of the standard called out of thin air. But um, the, generally speaking, parallelism is something that imposes extra requirements on the user and grants extra freedoms to the compiler in runtime, right? So if you're talking about most freedom for the compiler versus m most uh, freedom for the user, if you have that spectrum, right, you have uh, parallelism over here on most freedom for the, for the compiler uh, and for the OS. You have concurrency over here with the least freedom for the compiler and the OS. And right in the middle of that is actually serial execution. So does that make sense how parallelism and concurrency are opposites? It's actually a really important point to understand as you try and understand what's going on with all of these, all of the complexity of the executor's uh, progress. So, oh, and this is a very important point. Parallelism can be expressed with concurrent mechanisms at an additional cost, but not vice versa. So here's a really bad matrix multiply, and anyone who's ever written, tried to write a matrix multiply will, will laugh at this. So I'm gonna take my matrix, my, my matrices, and I'm going to loop over rows, loop over rows, loop over columns, and uh, create a thread for each operation that is parallel, right? Because I'm, I can express parallelism with a concurrent mechanism. Um, is there anyone in here who thinks this will be fast? Uh, yeah, so, uh, oh, probably the reason it's not fast is because I forgot to call reserve, right? That's, that's the, the problem here. Um, and I wasn't, I wasn't using memory order relax, right? I was using sequential memory order. So now this should be fast, right? Well, no, of course not. The problem, the problem here, the reason why this is so, all, all so, and all, this is so unreasonable and, this, and why we all kind of intuitively laugh at this is because we're using concurrent features to express parallelism. And there's a lot of overhead and unnecessary semantics being added to this program, right? So the, the, another way to say that is that the programming model being used here is not restrictive enough to avoid overhead. So the, the, the history of executors is, is to some extent a story of unifying concurrency and parallelism, right? 
So the networking TS, the concurrency TS, um, and a number of other parties involved are, are heavily focused on parallelism, right? Or sorry, on concurrency. So blocking is an, is an attribute of concurrency because it talks about how something makes forward progress with respect to something else, right? That's kind of a, a definition of, a, a hand wavy definition of blocking, right? Um, or, or the opposite of blocking. Um, and so like having these fine grained distinctions between the various kinds of blocking was a high priority for people coming from uh, the networking TS perspective. And from NVIDIA, from the parallelism, T parallelism TS, from high performance computing, uh, there's a lot of focus on parallelism concerns. So I showed you this really bad matrix multiply and, and, and that's because it was being expressed with concurrency and we were focusing, we focused much more on, HPC focuses much more on parallel problems, right? Um, so bulk execution was a was um, is a really succinct expression of parallelism without the extra costs of concurrency. So remember, I showed the, the bulk execution functions in the uh, NVIDIA proposal. And so the the challenge was to design a unified model where both of these concerns are fundamental. And that's it was it, it was and to some ex to to hopefully lesser extent now uh, still is a uh, open question as to whether you can actually make two concerns that are that opposite. Remember these things are complete opposites, right? Uh, fundamental within the same model. So um, back to the story. Um, the paper that was produced in, uh, is for Issaquah was P0443R0. It had 15 different execution functions in it. Uh, execute, post, defer, bulk execute. So we, took, we just took everything from all three proposals and like let's throw it into one proposal. Um, outer product of everything. We're like, well, we can't just throw all of these functions in there and take all the, all the possibilities. So we made different executor categories, which were like collections of functions that had to be there. They were roughly, nowadays we'd call them concepts, but concepts were a little bit shaky back then. Um, so we had like bulk one-way executor and non-blocking two-way executor. And um, there was automatic adaptation where some of these functions were missing to the other functions. And, there was uh, every executor had a context, so that was because that was part of the NVIDIA proposal. We made it mandatory for all of them. We were kind of doing the outer product of all of the different proposals. Um, oh yeah, and th there was also this problem that the context didn't really have to mean anything. So uh, this was the design. We had it's kind of small; it's hard to see, but we had all of these are the different executor categories. So we basically said uh, non-blocking one way was a concept that meant you had to have an execute, an execute with an alloc, a post, a post with an alloc, a defer, and a defer with an alloc. Um, and so we had, we had all of the, these sets of requirements that were not really orthogonal to each other. Um, uh, it was kind of a disaster. Some of the functions didn't have any concepts that required them. Uh, some of the, they were, they were kind of, it's pretty hard to reason about what's going on here. So we refined things in, in revision one by adding more functions that didn't have to um, have categories and taking away some of the categories. Um, and uh, that, as you might imagine, didn't really improve things all that much. We came to uh, the 2017 Kona meeting with this diagram of like, well, it's really pretty simple. If you have this function, then this function exists automatically. and these. I don't even remember what these dotted lines versus solid lines meant. I think if it was a member function, then uh, if the function was a member function, then the adaptation happened automatically. If it was a non-member function, then the dotted line, uh, then only the solid line adaptations happened. And uh, this is, uh, didn't go over very well. Uh, so <laughs> I believe this is roughly a direct quote from somewhere. I'm not really allowed to directly quote um, C++ meetings, but um, standards meetings, but uh, that uh, was the general sentiment of the room. They said this is not viable, this is not something we can teach to people, it's not something we can understand, look at all of this stuff flying around, I don't even know if something's gonna happen if I pass a function to it. Um, and again, they're, they're, they came to us and said, why is this so much more complicated than stood invoke? I mean, I, we'd expect maybe twice as complicated or something, but this is like 30 times as complicated or something. Um, so where was all the complexity coming from? And the, the bottom line here is that uh, we hadn't yet learned this lesson about 
separating orthogonal aspects of design. And this really applies to any, uh, any generic library design in any domain. Um, the extent to which it applies is going to depend on how generic you need to be, and that's the discussion you need to have. But um, so these were all of our functions. And we had this one, we had, uh, can, you tell, can you guys see the colors there? A little bit. Um, we had these orthogonal aspects of the, um, of the different uh, methods, the different, uh, I'm sorry, the different functions, right? Uh, the different execution functions. Um, and we were kind of encoding those in like the name, which is not a very good way to enco encode an aspect of design, right? So um, the provision of a result channel, right? Like something like a st stood future. Um, some of them did, some of them didn't. Some of them provided the result immediately, right? Um, we had the cardinality, so we had all the single functions and all the bulk functions, and the only way that that was really encoded um, was this bulk underscore in the front of it, right? So it, it makes it very hard. Uh, we had always blocking, never blocking, possibly blocking. We had um, this preference for the first step of the closure, so to block until the until you, you know, to do the execution in line and, uh, until you have to block, or to prefer doing the execution after um, after the apparent function finishes. Uh, so, and most of the rest of them had no preference at all. Um, and so you get this combinatorial explosion, and, we, and, and this, this approach really doesn't scale. We hadn't even included timed execution, delayed execution, prioritized execution. These are a lot of things that were actually fundamental concerns in early proposals that we knew were going to have to be added eventually, but uh, we hadn't you know, even gotten there yet. And so we, uh, we needed a way to communicate orthogonal properties of execution in a way that scales up better than this. Um, so we collected... Uh, Cross-cutting concern is another term for this kind of thing that's used in uh, programming models literature. And uh, we, we decided uh, we needed a mechanism to express these cross-cutting concerns. And we, we kind of started to collect properties of what this mechanism would look like, right? So we needed it to be extensible because we knew there were things that we hadn't included yet that we were going to need eventually. We needed it to be forwardable because we knew that not everyone was going to care about everything. Not everyone's going to care about timed execution, and they need to be able to forward it on to whoever else might care at some other level of the stack. Uh, sticky, kind of the opposite of that, right? And you need to be able to pass through the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm saying this the other way around. Forwardable, you need to be able to pass through an adapter to something that, um, to something that may not know about your property. Sticky means that you may need to pass it on to your result if you apply an algorithm even if you don't know about it necessarily. Uh, overridable, um, so if you do know about it and you do know that you need to change it at a lower layer of the stack. And then all of these concerns needed to be escapable, so something like uh, escaping from overridable would be something like final, right? So you would need to be able to um, say at some layer of the stack that no layer below me is allowed to uh, override this property. Um, so let's talk about how we got there. Um, and this has taken uh, quite some time to get our minds around this. Um, and it's taken some of the world's experts in concept-driven design working with us very carefully um, to understand how to express something uh, this complicated. Uh, so what, what, are, uh, what, is concept, what are concepts? Um, well, a concept, and I should be very clear, uh, we're talking about concepts as a design feature rather than a current, the current language feature. The current language feature only really expresses constraints, and we gave it a really unfortunate name um, because when we started giving it the name, it actually meant a little bit more than that, and then we realized that we can't do that. Um, and so now it's mostly just constraints. But concept-driven design is as old as templates um, themselves, right? Anytime you take something generically, you are implicitly assuming something about its semantics and something about its um, its interface, its constraints, right? So uh, here's a couple of useful quotes. There's a 2011 paper about concept-driven design. It's starting to date a little bit, but it's, it's actually still a fantastic read. I totally recommend it. Um, Andrew Sutton and Bjarne Strustrup. Um, and their, their basic thesis was that concepts are constraints plus axioms. And by axioms, they kind of mean 
uh, semantics of the thing. And constraints, they mean the interface, right? Um, and Eric Niebler, uh, one of the world's experts on concept-driven design, author of the Ranges TS, um, says that you find your concepts by looking at the algorithms, which is counterintuitive because you would think that you're looking at, um, you think you look at the types, right? Because they're, they're, they're constraints on, on what you can do with the type. But they're really constraints on what the algorithms need to do with that type. Um, and that, that thinking actually goes all the way back to, well, not all the way, but unsurprisingly back to Stepanov, as do many, most good things in the world. Um, so he says, uh, he was talking about iterators in this particular context, but uh, this is the oldest, oldest version of this thinking that we could find. It says, in some sense, the only way for someone to fully understand why they have to be the way they are is trying hundreds of different algorithms and finding the abstraction that allows the most beautiful and efficient representation of them. Um, and yeah, so trying to write code in terms of them. And sadly enough, people tend to define abstractions faster than they try them. So let's talk about what algorithms are we targeting with executors explicitly and then maybe kind of implicitly going forward. The parallel algorithms um, in the, uh, that went into C++ 17, uh, we uh, assume uh, when executors are finished, we'll have uh, executor related versions. We're not exactly sure of the form of that, but we have a fairly good idea. And the networking TS, which has been written in terms of executors also, um, which has these algorithms, async write, async connect, et cetera. Um, and then because we're working on the standard, we have to be a little bit aware of things that might be coming in the future, not write ourselves out of it. That's probably a, it's a smaller concern than the things we already know are coming, right? But it, it is, still has to be a little bit of a concern. So uh, those, that's our algorithm set. Let's talk about the, the two parts, these constraints plus, um, these constraints plus axioms, right? It's, it's this bimodal optimization problem that uh, you're doing when you try and design concepts for a given algorithm set. Um, so uh, you, you have these two extremes where you can just take, for, for the constraints, right, the interface of the type, you can just take, on, on the one extreme, you could take every type or every close to the same type in your algorithm set and say, anything you pass to my algorithm has to have all of the methods on all of the types. Right, so that would be like the inner product, the notionally the inner product of all of the constraints. And you have very few concepts, and it, it makes it really easy for someone to get an idea of the, the user interface of your library, uh, but you don't have a lot of flexibility. Uh, on the other hand, you could take every algorithm individually and say, what are the uh, functions and methods that get called on this object in this single algorithm? And then make a, you know, you could make a, a sortable, and then you could make a stable sortable. And those could be separate concepts, because maybe you're doing one thing different in, the, in one of the algorithms from the other. And that, uh, that, has, that has major issues with cognitive load, right? The user can't, doesn't have a way to keep those two things in the same box in their head, right? Um, and uh, I'm not going to read both of these quotes, but the, the particularly uh, good one from this paper in, in 2011 was, uh, an effective specification, specification of concepts is the product of an iterative process that minimizes the number of concepts while maintaining expressive and effective constraints. So, so you're trying to find some medium in between these two, right? Um, and the analog of that on the other side is the uh, axiom set optimization. So the set of semantic axioms that you want to define on your concepts for your algorithm set, right? Um, and you again have the same option, right? You have the inner product where as long as the things are, as long as the semantics are non-conflicting, you make it so that every type in your algorithm set, uh, every template in your algorithm set has to have all of the semantics needed for all of the algorithms. Um, and the other side of that is each algorithm has its own set of semantics individually. Um, and, and no one can ever think about them unless they read through essentially, and you're, you're, at that point you're essentially kind of repeating your source code, right, of your algorithm in the concept. You're right, you're saying like, well, this does this, I called this, 
um, and it should do this. Uh, I call this, and it should do this, and I call this, and it should do this. And, and that's obviously not a good way to go about doing uh, constraint design either, or um, sorry, semantic design, uh, concept design. We'll get there. OK. Uh, I am going to claim this is the hard part. Um, the, OK, yeah, I, I have. Um, yeah, I'm going to claim this is the hard part. Sorry, I didn't. I, I have this bad habit of saying the things in the bullet points and then showing the bullet points later. But um, so why is this hard? Um, I'm. I would claim that the. Well, while people potentially argue more about the interface part because it's bike shedding, it's it's easy for people to talk about you know having a method named this and having a method named that or having a, a a uh, namespace scope function that acts like this, um, that acts on this thing with this name. The important part that people actually deep down disagree about um, is the uh, semantic properties. So not every user cares about every behavior. Some users really care about certain behaviors. And many concepts are unusual, uh, uh, unus unusable in certain domains without being accompanied by certain semantic properties. Um, different domains have different axiom sets uh, for different concepts. Um, so remember, anytime we're doing something in the standard, we're trying to focus on standardizing existing practice, right? It, that, is, that is a major driving, um, motivating factor uh, whenever we can. And uh, so generally, we still want to try and focus, if we're doing generic code at all, we still want to focus on things that span multiple domains. We're not if, if it's just one domain, then the standard shouldn't really have to care about it, unless it's something that's really, really hard to get right, or for whatever reason. Uh, and here's the key point, right, is that you can have semantic requirements, but there, may not, there still may not be enough information on those semantic requirements to be sufficiently consistent with the zero overhead principle. So if we think back to std thread, right, std thread does express the parallelism, but it doesn't express a tight enough constraint on the parallelism, right? It doesn't express a tight enough restraint on the semantic requirements um, of the algorithm. So um, going beyond this, beyond concept design, simple concept design, there's this issue of the nested concerns problem. And I'm, try I'm going to try and uh, explain this. I have like three different shots at trying to explain this. If you don't get it the first time, don't worry about it. I'm going to explain it in the abstract with frobnicators, and I'm going to explain it in concrete with s several other things. So suppose we have this, these, these two algorithms that act on this thing. We're going to call it a span-like, right? We're going to completely not even talk about executors for a minute. We're going to talk about a thing that looks like a span and acts like a span. It's some span of memory. Suppose we came up with some way to define that, based on looking at our algorithm set, to define that concept. Um, and yay, we've expressed both of these algorithms with the same set of constraints. But suppose Frobnicate 2 um, is a performance critical, um, is being called in a performance critical context, um, like here, where it's in an inner loop. Um, and it won't run efficiently unless there's some pre-processing done such that the span-like accesses are fast. Does the caller of Frobnicate 1 need to know that the, um, the fast access is um, necessary for the span-like being passed to Frobnicate 1? No, because that, that, would be, that would be leaking an impl implementation detail, right? It would be leaking an implementation detail to say that, well, the way that Frobnicate 2 is being called is in an inner loop. Um, but because of the way we design concepts, with, with just using pure concepts, the, the op current options are we, we would need to like expand the span-like concept to kind of expose this random access efficiency so that when you construct the span-like thing, you, you know that it needs to um, build up this maybe cache or something like that. And, and uh, then if you get you know, the version of Frobnicate that gets passed to it, that gets passed to span like without uh, a, the right random access efficiency would, would set that up inside. And the one that does would not, right? Um, but that, that's 
imposing additional cognitive load on the caller of Frobnicate 1. And another option is we could just be okay with the, the efficiency loss. And uh, sure. Um, I don't think that's really a good solution, personally. Um, okay, so um, does this apply to the standard library? And how does this apply to the standard library? So we suppose we have now are introducing a, 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 an apply standard for obnication algorithm. Um, and it, it acts on a, a, a frobnicator concept, and there's some third party library providing a, a, a frobnicator, and then there's some user calling the standard frobnication with the third party frobnicator, right? So, so fundamentally, exe executors are a three party concern, and that's what makes it so difficult from a uh, generic programming design perspective. And so this is a, this is a three party problem. Oh, look, I had notes for what I just said. Okay, so this is an issue of cross-cutting concerns, right? Uh, apply frobnication needs to communicate some cross-cutting concern to the frobnicator, third-party frobnicator, without um, adding to the cognitive load of the frobnicator concept, right? We don't want to add to the frobnicator load of the guy, uh, frobnicator, the, <laughs> the cognitive load of the guy uh, writing my frobnicate, because doing so would do things like leak the implementation of apply standard frobnication, right? Um, and uh, my frobnicate may need to communicate some special concern to the third-party frobnicator that's, that's far too special for us to ever put into the standard library. It's domain-specific, but it's, it's um, necessary in a particular domain, right? Um, and it, it's entirely possible, uh, oh, and then the third-party um, frobnicator needs a way to know that the standard's concern is, is somehow orthogonal or not to the user's concern. So you need a, a clear common mechanism for these, this communication of cross-cutting concerns. Well, that sounds a little bit contrived. I bet there's nothing that you could come up with in the standard algorithm that would have that going on. So I, finally, I'm going to stop talking about frobnicators and talk about something real. So do I have notes? No, I don't have notes on this one. OK. <laughs> so. Um, Suppose we're introducing the ranges version of sort that takes an execution policy, uh, which is not in the standard right now, but suppose we're, we're, we're going to introduce that. And um, suppose we've extended execution policy to be something that takes an executor, right? Um, we have some third party executor, right? And uh, we have um, a user library that has um, a range, and they have a special comparator, and they want to use that special comparator to sort the range, right? Um, and they want to do it using the executor. They say uh, std par. So this is the this is the syntax that we've been kind of playing around with for what it would look like to incorporate executors into the standard library. Uh, sorry, into the standard library algorithms, um, because uh, as you all know, because you're all good C plus plus seventeen enthusiasts, std par uh, without the dot on is how you do parallel algorithms in C plus plus seventeen. Um, since all implementations now support it with brilliant speed. Um, that is not meant to be a, a dig at implementers. This is an incredibly difficult problem, and especially since we didn't really give them enough information. But um, so anyway, uh, my library needs knows something about the implementation of the comparator that it needs to communicate to the executor. Um, so. Uh, what it, what's the thing? Oh, maybe the the um, the it wants the executor to store the uh, comparator in some sort of special memory, right? Uh, some sort of uh, scratch pad or manually managed cache um, that is faster, right? It's still addressable, so we can still talk about it within the standard, but it's maybe faster, and that that's a performance concern, right? Um, and the implementation of std sort may need to communicate something like uh, say task priorities to the executor, but if, if we were to put those task priorities um, into the interface given to, the al to my algorithm, um, we would be leaking an implementation detail right, of std sort. Um, and um, my library may also need to communicate something, wait, oh yeah, my library may also need to communicate something to the standard library that the, uh, Third-party executor doesn't need to, doesn't care about. For instance, the 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 we could say use a different sort algorithm that doesn't do quite as much copying of the comparator, right? That's something that you could 
that you could need to tell the sort that the, the uh, third party executor doesn't need to know about at all because that's inherent to the algorithm itself and inherent to the, to the calls to the, to the executor rather than the, the executor's execution itself. So did that make any sense to anyone? I'll pause a second and someone, can, this is a probably a good second to pause and ask if anyone, if people are following or if anyone has a question or if people understand this. This is one of the most complicated parts of the presentation, so I'm trying to take it a little slowly. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, so there are three parties, and they all able to talk to their neighbor, but the, the third of the three doesn't necessarily need to know about the communication between the two. Exactly, exactly. So that's, the, that's a fantastic summary. There are three parties, and they, they all have pairwise communication concerns that would be essentially non-starters if they couldn't be expressed. You did just write, you end up writing your own instead. But adding that complexity for the, for the third party in each of the pairwise cases would introduce sufficient cognitive load that, it's, that it would be uh, infeasible to uh, scalably implement, implement all of those different uh, libraries. Um, so yes, that I, I summarized what you said, I think, but I think that's what, what you said, roughly. Um, it's, it's pairwise concerns in a three-party scenario. So we came up with this um, mechanism we called the properties mechanism, um, which I, I guess we're taking kind of an important name there, and LEWG can always tell us to use some other name, but we've been calling it that. Um, so here's how we fix the Frobnicate example. We have this, and this is by example, we have the, these, these customization points, objects, prefer, require, and um, query. Um, this is an example of expressing a performance preference to the object. And notice that, um, for those of you not yet familiar with uh, C++20 uh, uh, concept syntax, notice that when we go from the span like and we, we prefer some property onto it, we end up with something back that meets the requirements of the same concept. So we haven't increased the cognitive load of the, cogni uh, of the concept set. But it can be a different type, right? We don't care. We, all we care about is that it has the same semantics and the same interface, right? So we're introducing some property to the type. And, because, and, and, and the reason, part of the reason I use span like here, right, is because we can, we can set aside the issue of making copies and stuff. Properties work much better on um, things with reference-like semantics, right? They're, they're value types still, because everything we use in, we try and make everything we use in, in C++ value types, but it has, uh, it, has refer it refers to something underlying it. Go ahead. Could you find a little bit like the decorator pattern? The decorator pattern. So if you're referring to uh, decorators like decorators in Python? No, not decorators in Python, decorators as uh, pattern, as in rainbow for pattern. Uh, that is potentially true. It would be very embarrassing if I missed that connection. I've always seen it as a connection to um, aspect-oriented programming to some extent. It's a cross-cutting concern. It's introducing a cross-cutting concern that doesn't change the semantics. Um, I really should have seen the connection to the Gang of Four decorator pattern. Um, I'm not familiar enough with it off the top of my head, so I, I can't say either way, but if, if that is the case, that will be in the next version of this presentation. And I will have even more reasons to tell the committee that this is something that is it's not new. This is something that we're just introducing into C++ for the first time. Yeah. Oh, OK. Another time I uh, had notes and everything I just said. All right. <laughs> so um, we're jumping a little bit in time because the, the point at which this was extracted from the, um, from the P0443 proposal was actually much later. But um, the point in the timeline that it was introduced into the P0443 proposal was right here. So um, we provided uh, three main uh, customiz uh, customization point objects, and they all had different semantics with respect to the properties. So um, require returns an object 
that is similar to the uh, first argument, but it addresses the cross-cutting concern associated with the property. Um, and I, can go, I could go into a lot more detail about it, what it means for a cross-cutting concern to be associated with a property, but the idea in general is that a property is, is some expression of a cross-cutting concern or a collection of cross-cutting concerns, hopefully just one, or hopefully just one aspect of that cross-cutting concern. Um, and if it's already addressed, it can return it directly, right? So this, th in this way, you, you have the ability to say, if someone above me on the stack already set up this random access cache, there's no reason to do it again, right? Um, but you don't have to care about who's, what people above you on the stack do, unless someone above you on the stack has said absolutely never set up a random access cache, right? If someone has invoked this kind of final attribute. Um, the uh, expression fails to compile if there's no way to address this concern um, with this property. So that's, that's actually very important because then uh, for, for generic algorithms, um, anyway, I'm sorry that, that, that wasn't a, a good way to say this, but we have, the, the difference between require and prefer is basically that, um, oh, that's pleasant, I'm missing a closing parenthesis, oh well. Um, uh, the difference between re pref prefer and require is that um, it just returns the same thing rather than failing at, at compile time. So we have, we have one for properties that we want to be able to treat as you know, always there after the require succeeds um, kind of uh, at compile time and, and, and for the programmer to be able to reason about that property being there um, after the uh, require happens. And another one that says basically, um, if you can do this, do it. Um, and then query uh, is slightly different from the other two. It kind of returns some information about how the, ob um, how the argument addresses the property. So that's often just a Boolean saying, well, someone required this aspect or someone required this, that aspect. But it can be a number of things, right? One, um, one thing that you may want to do for many different types of objects is query its allocator, right? Because um, an allocator is a thing that addresses the cross-cutting concern of allocation. Um, and so that would return an allocator rather than a Boolean, right? Um, OK, I'm a little bit out of breath, so I'm going to take a sip of water. But does anyone have any questions about what's going on there? So the library surface area of this proposal is really pretty small. Um, it's just these three things, but the implications of it are pretty um, intense. So um, yeah, it's require. Yeah, um, that is also interesting, right? Because requires is a keyword um, now. But um, I would be totally OK if this ends up being renamed require property or something that's less confusing in that respect. Uh, but there is, a, there is a nice aspect of this in that this is, a, this is an analog of requires, but for uh, non-semantically uh, necessary attributes, right? Um, and I'll, I'll go into more of what that means in a minute. Um, so yeah, how do, how do properties address our needs? Uh, I wanted to basically show the idea of why this is um, such a, a strong um, mechanism um, in that you can, you can write an adapter that adds some um, property to uh, a given type, um, but then forwards all the properties it doesn't know that's the wrong button, forwards all the properties that it doesn't know about through this, the same mechanism. Uh, so it's basically this ability to forward something um, where the, the property is, is a template parameter, right? We've expressed the cross-cutting concern in, some, in terms of something that we can be generic over. Um, I don't know if that helps kind of get an idea of what's going on here and why this is so powerful. Um, it's also dangerous for different reasons, and we, we'll go into that in a bit. Um, but uh, so we introduced uh, 
in uh, P0688. So there are a lot of, a lot of uh, paper numbers in this presentation. So uh, P0688, uh, we introduced uh, uh, these properties, or uh, we proposed the introduction of these properties, and then uh, we followed that up with a, uh, another, paper, another revision of P0443. Um, so we basically, before we had sync execute, um, which had like all of these semantics kind of implicit uh, to the name. And afterwards, we can just put them all directly in the require. Now that, that looks more verbose and you're like, well, Ed, you know, I, don't, I don't like having to type that much. And so, well, first of all, um, you're likely not typing this much. You're likely programming to a layer that's on top of the executors. And I'll get into why that is in a little bit. Um, but uh, secondly, this is much more understandable, right? You can look at each aspect individually and say, oh, this is being applied, this is being applied, this is being applied. So defer got, got expressed in terms of a preference for executing the continuation plus the requirement of single in one way. And um, async post was um, the opposite of defer. It said prefer not the continuation, but it also requires two-way because it's async. So you can see how we're kind of pulling the aspects of this name naming convention out of the name and putting them into something that you can program with. Um, and uh, from that, we went from 16 functions to six functions plus a bunch of properties. And that was actually a fairly significant simplification. It's still, we've done much better since then, but um, this step was something that uh, was really popular. Most changes since then have been a kind of a basic refinement on this idea. And so uh, we brought this to the November 2017 Albuquerque meeting, and SG1 finally said, this is our preferred direction for executors for the future. And so all was happy, except uh, I'm only this far into my presentation. So, um, so Jacksonville. Um, we brought a new revision of P0443 to Jacksonville to just you know, tie up some loose ends and go through library evolution working group. Um, to, uh, oh yeah, we, uh, uh, Luke asked for a, uh, for a polymorphic wrapper and for uh, some removal of the basic executor concept because it didn't do anything anymore um, because we had kind of divided it up into one-way executors and bulk executors uh, and two-way executors and, and the only things that were in common between the, the two of them now was like copy constructability or something. So they, they made these like minor suggestions and uh, a few more minor changes. Uh, it looked po poised to move to wording, and anyone who's been involved in the committee knows that generally once you go to wording, you're, you, you don't go back. <laughs> Alistair is raising eyebrows um, because sometimes you do, but that, that's, that's generally when people think of their design as being uh, solidified a little bit um, and heading towards standardization. So here's a, a timeline kind of giving an idea of what's going on here, um, where we are. And then, um, so as you may have suspected, that wasn't the end of the story. Um, let's talk about task chaining in uh, P0443. So we had this uh, then execute method and these two-way execute methods that returned some sort of output channel. We were calling it a future um, as kind of a placeholder, but we we didn't want it to be actually stood future or actually stood experimental future even really um, super long term. So, I mean, this was the way that you, in P0443, um, chained execution functions one after another, right? Um, and so, yeah, there was this question of what do these two-way functions return? And, and it was actually pretty ill-defined in um, P0443. So in P0443R1, we said, uh, we knew this was a problem. We said one immediate concern is the conceptualization of stood future like types. And uh, an elaboration of the requirements is, is needed. Um, and then uh, we tried to do that and it was really hard. And so then in revisions two through seven, we said a type F meets the future requirements if it is exactly stood experimental future, which is a, not a very good description of 
a concept that's actually just a description of a type. Um, <laughs> so I, I think we kind of assumed that um, the future concept was separable, separable enough to be elaborated later. Um, maybe that was a mistake. So we, we did actually, uh, authors of, several authors of the P0443 paper did actually get together in a separate project. We also had several other contributors and authors and try and write down what is the design of the future concept for P0443 that we've kind of been hand waving at for this whole time. It was kind of, you know, now that 443 is advancing, we should really finally do this. And um, the basic idea behind that effort, uh, we, we did several face-to-face -face meetings and we came up with the point that um, within an executor, it kind of doesn't matter that much, right? If you're using the same executor, whatever gets returned, you're still passing it back to the same executor. And so the interface doesn't matter a whole lot as long as you, it's something you can pass to then execute. But when you pass it to a different executor, right? A different executor is then execute, then it needs to have some concrete requirements and semantics. And um, so we, we kind of focused on the idea that these futures are the glue that allow you to connect disparate ex, um, executor types into a single chain. And uh, so we introduced this concept called a semi-future, which was like um, a, a future that was not bound to a known executor. Um, and you couldn't really do anything with the semi-future except for bind it to an executor. And then uh, using via, um, and that would turn a semi-future into a continuable future, right? And then a continuable future was something you could call dot then on, and then and you, you start up your chain again, right? Uh, and that was how we kind of described the glue. It seems like it's maybe a little bit overcomplicated, but when you really sit down and think about this for um, several months, you, you end up with this making a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't actually supposed to be a joke, but you can laugh if you want. <laughs> Uh, there's, an, there's an enormous amount of work that has gone into all of these proposals, and I, I, I really want to try and do justice to everyone. So, um, yeah, I appreciate bearing, you bearing with me on all of this history here. Um, yeah, so like I said, only continuable future could have work chained onto it. Um, so then, uh, while this was happening, we were kind of looking at this 1054 design and saying, there, there's some missing things here. Um, and alongside that, um, another group of people out of Facebook um, uh, wrote a proposal saying, uh, basically these problems are inherent to the, to the design of then execute. They're not, they're not problems that can be fixed by writing uh, a better future concept. Um, so using this, this piece of code as an example, uh, the basic objection was that if you wanted to be lazy about when you execute your work, right? When do you know that you have the full chain of work? Um, and that, that's a real problem, right? Y you can actually do it. The, the only way to do it really is to do something in the destructor of the last return of then execute. But destructors are a really, really bad place to do things, to execute work. So, uh, P1055 really argued that uh, 443 effectively required people to execute change or executors to execute uh, chains of work eagerly, which is uh, not generic enough for, for all of the needs. There was also another paper that came out saying um, uh, the error channel is missing. So roughly speaking, move fast and break things, but give us an error channel. It's a joke because it was a Facebook paper. Um, Oh, I thought that was the funniest joke in the whole presentation. Um, okay, um, so yeah, P0443 was very weak on error handling, uh, largely because a lot of the contributors to 443 um, generally write programs that uh, just abort when they have errors, uh, which is not, and, and you, you laugh, but the, there's large segments of people who do very complicated things with, without ever catching errors. Um, and so we hadn't thought about it enough, and, and, and it was definitely missing. Um, and this distinction between one-way execution, or like fire and forget execution, and two-way execution where you return to future channel was only really focused on value reporting, not error reporting. So you couldn't have something that was one-way with respect to value, but two-way with respect to error. You couldn't have something that you launched and said, I'll fire and forget, 
um, but I don't care about the return value, but I do care if you um, fail, um, which is actually a pretty common use case if you think about it, uh, particularly when you can't enqueue something because you're you know, out of queue space or out of memory or something like that. So uh, P1053 basically argued that the concept describing the argument to execute and all of the other uh, execution functions should have provide a richer face, a richer interface for error handling, um, and helper. It also should provide helper functions to create these plain, this interface out of plain callables. The original interface proposed in this paper, which was basically designed to be as uh, little dis as as little disruption as possible was to say okay um, there's an optional exception channel that also uses the call operator and that way you can provide just a plain old lambda and it'll still meet the requirements of this thing um, but if you do provide a second overload of the call operator um, then the error channel will be used that way and uh, we've since decided that over you know, customization points as overloads is not a generally a good idea in this um, kind of design, but the, the general idea is there. Um, and so <laughs> LEWG told us, hey, uh, unify, please. Um, so the authors of 1055 joined the teleconferences. And uh, the, uh, and we set up an additional set of weekly teleconferences to address the designs of the future concept and try and move that forward in a way that was going to be consistent with the redesign of the, uh, of the um, then execute method. And uh, yet another compromise proposal was prepared. I think this, during this six month period I was doing, see we were doing every other week calls on Monday for the Europeans to join. We were doing every week calls on Wednesday for futures, um, and we were doing every week calls on Friday for executors. So we put a, a whole lot of time, and none of the, this is not our day job. None of us, this is our day job, right? So there's a lot of effort put into this. Um, so disclaimer, please bear with me. This is the part of the talk where I'm trying to explain some technical shortcomings and solutions that um, a, more than a dozen very smart people, and then also me, um, worked for several years on weekly teleconferences, and we didn't see them until they were pointed out to us. So these are not um, simple things to explain, but I'm going to try anyway. So we brought another compromise proposal to, um, oh, I believe it was the San Diego meeting, the 2018 San Diego meeting. Um, and this, this was built on this, these concepts of senders and receivers. And I'm going to get into what that means. It, the, the real goal of this was to express the dependency chains in a model that was generic over lazy and eager execution. Different domains have different requirements there. And some domains require uh, lazy execution. Some domains require eager execution. Um, and the resulting model involved concepts called uh, senders and receivers that, gen that were generalizations of futures and promises, respectively. Um, so a sender is a, is a generalization of a future where the execution is chained using submit with a receiver rather than um, a uh, dot then function. And I'm going to go through what the difference between that is here, what the different aspects of that here are. Um, th the main point is that rather than a um, outputting via return, so if you guys were here for one of the earlier talks that I um, asked questions about that were perhaps too intrusive. Um, I talked about how outputting putting via return um, is too constraining for many use cases, right? Because you have to construct something, right? Um, whereas if you output via a uh, parameter, you can, whenever you're ready, you can call uh, some function on that parameter. So, I mean, the simplest form of outputting via parameter, right? is to take a reference and call the assignment operator, right? That, that, that assignment operator is a function just like anything else, of course, um, or it can be thought of as a function like anything else. And so that's, that's the simplest form, right, of outputting via parameter, but you can actually have much, much less constraining forms of outputting via parameter. And um, receiver was the generalization of the thing that you output via. Um, so 
Here's a very simple example of how this works, right? Um, do I have steps through this? I do have steps through this. All right, I'm actually using them. Um, a sender is a type that can be submitted to with the receiver. So this is the, the expression of the requirements of a sender. And this, this particular sender is something that has a value already. And when it gets a receiver, all it does is uh, call set value once and call uh, set done. These have actually now been changed to dot value and dot done, but I'm actually using the 1194 and not the uh, syntax here, just to avoid being confusing. But, um, and we have a receiver that all it does is print the thing out when it gets a value and print out a new line when the, all of its senders are, all of the corresponding senders are done sending to it, right? Um, and so here's how we would print 42. Um, in an unnecessarily complex way, but in a very generic way. Um, the, uh, we create the sender, uh, and we submit a receiver, and then this program will print 42 and a new line. Does that sort of kind of make sense conceptually as to what's going on here? So this is, this is what's called a, a uh, push-style programming model, where each kind of piece of the model is pushing information onto the next piece, right? Um, that's probably a terrible definition of a push style programming model. And someone can correct me on Twitter or in the YouTube comments. But um, roughly speaking, that's, that's what a push style programming model means. Um, and um, so make value task was proposed as an alternative to then execute that um, was kind of the drop-in replacement to, to reach feature parity with P0443. It chains a sender to a, a value continuation and uh, returns another sender, right? So, and it, and it, it just handles errors by rethrowing them uh, because that's what essentially the P0443 model did. So we were trying to achieve parity with that and then we were gonna add to that later. Um, and so, uh, and this is, slightly wrong because the make value task also takes an executor. Um, so I'm going to skip that example because it's correctly um, done on the next slide. But uh, this is, um, this node is important here and probably shouldn't be like grayed out and small. But um, if you intend to be a user of executors, um, don't think of this as like what you're going to have to write in the future if, if all of this goes through. Um, future, no pun intended, haha. -ha. Um, this is intended to be a generic framework that you can build programming models on top of, and that the programming models that are most familiar to a particular domain can be built on top of with zero overhead, right? So if you're used to writing programs in terms of future promises, futures and promises, in terms of future.then, et cetera, this is something that the person who's building your future, um, your, your, your future type, sorry, not your actual future, um, can um, build on top of and be able to interoperate with um, other models uh, as a result. So um, yes. So what happened to executors here? Well, um, in the P1194 model, an executor is just a sender of a sub-executor representing its scheduling decision. So um, yeah, that, that takes a minute to unpack that um, idea. Uh, but it makes sense if you walk through it, right? Um, P1194 seeks to represent potentially deferred information as a sender, right? And so to act on that information, you attach a receiver to the sender. In general, the scheduling of work is a potentially deferred operation, right? You may want to wait to see the state of the system when you're going to run something before you decide what thread you're going to run it on, right? Or if you're in a thread pool, right, you may decide what thread you're going to run it on based on what thread's available. Or if you're doing work stealing, right? So it's, it is a deferred decision, and therefore it should be represented as a sender, 
right? And that's, that's kind of how the logic went. And um, when we first saw this, this was kind of an indicator that we were on the right track, I think. Um, because anytime you're doing programming model design, when you start to see self-similarity, um, and the self-similarity is not forced, but almost accidental, uh, it's, not, um, it's not a guarantee, but it's often an indicator that you're on the right track. Um, so what does this look like with make value task? Um, so basically what we would do is say, uh, we're, this is, this is kind of how we would say we're starting a chain of execution. We're saying, uh, use this executor to make a task that is, has a sender that is that executor itself. Um, and the task should just return 42. And so now we come out with a sender, right? This is, I should have maybe said sender auto instead of just auto. Um, and that sender has a submit method, um, which can take a receiver. And now that will be executed uh, on the, uh, the context represented by the executor. Oh, OK. Well, that was super helpful. Uh, I really wish I had more time to get into the amazing things that sub-executors enable. It was really one of the aha moments along our journey. Um, I don't. That's, this isn't a five-hour talk. That's a nice talk in and of itself. Um, sub-executors were kind of one of my babies in this uh, whole process. So I'm very enthusiastic about talking about sub-executors and all the things that they enable and all the things that we can do with them. But um, I have to move on because I have 18 minutes left. So. Uh, so what's so great about senders and receivers? Let me uh, try and summarize this in, ter in, in, in terms that can be put onto one slide. And maybe not all of these thing bullet points will make sense to everyone, but at least some bullet points should make sense to some people, hopefully. Um, so sender-receiver appro uh, approaches is a very restricted programming model, right? And it, it actually forbids the generic pro programmer from assuming anything about eagerness or laziness, um, which allows us to be generic over things that we know there are certain, certain hardware, certain execution contexts that we know need to be eager and certain execution contexts that we know need to be lazy. Um, and if the generic programmer is assuming either of those, then you will not have efficient execution in one case or the other case. Um, and this allows the executor the freedom to control eagerness uh, and uh, granularity of tasks and uh, granularity of tasks within a chain. Um, based on execution model concerns. So uh, this was another kind of aha moment for a number of us. Um, sender receiver is a generaliz generalization of both future promise programming models and the observer uh, pattern from the Gang of Four. So I've already been called out on my lack of Gang of Four knowledge once this talk, but hopefully not again. Um, and uh, reactive programming was a big part of this, part of the uh, uh, issues raised by the 1055 authors was that executors don't work really well for reactive programming models um, using the observer pattern. And both of these, both of these kind of opposite ends of the spectrum uh, for programming models have straightforward zero overhead implementations on top of senders and receivers. So, um, and, and beyond that, there's this, uh, if you look at P1341, what? Yes. So Lewis Baker, probably um, one of the world's experts in coroutine library design, if not the single expert, um, has been working with us on this um, now. And um, he wrote a paper showing that there's a direct connection between senders and coroutine awaitables. Um, and if you, you look at this, this world very carefully, you actually find that um, senders and receivers plus coroutines uh, they together represent a scalable uh, means of coexistence between push style and pull style programming models, which is, those are two word, worlds that have been pretty disparate, and it's been an open problem in general for, for quite some time as to how to unify those kinds of approaches. So Bellevue. So uh, Herb Sutter sent out this email, said that the uh, average weather in September is perfect. And so um, that isn't actually, actually a direct quote, you can look up the paper. 
Um, but um, so we had this special two-day meeting for executors uh, in September 2018 um, to address the issue of executors for C++ 20 because we were coming in very close on the end of um, design deadlines for C++ 20. We are now well past that. Um, and um, so we just we discussed a, res a revised version of P0443 alongside uh, 1194. And um, the consensus of this kind of uh, special meeting was that uh, combined LEWG and SG1 meeting was that senders and receivers are the preferred long-term direction for executors. But uh, they also said, we don't need two-way executors for the currently proposed C++ 20 use cases. Um, parallel algorithms don't actually have um, result channels. They return uh, in a blocking fashion. And um, the mechanisms in the networking TS were uh, also sufficiently decoupled from two-way execution. Um, and so um, they also, uh, I guess I should say we, I was, I was kind of also, I was under trial and also one of the voters, but um, uh, uh, we determined that the one-way portion of P0443 was sufficient for these cases targeting 20. And um, so the 443 authors were asked to bring a proposal for the one-way part only to San Diego meeting. San Diego, we're almost, th okay, we're almost there. We've got 13 minutes left and we are all actually almost there. Uh, so P0443 R9. Uh, was presented in uh, the San Diego meeting. And LEWG basically said, this property mechanism is really great. In fact, it's so great, we don't want it to be in namespace std execution. It should just be in namespace std. And uh, you should probably explore its implications in a much broader context and bring us a separate paper. And all the rest of it, they basically said all the rest of it's not that controversial. So we brought two papers to Kona, 443R10 um, and 1393R0. And uh, long story short, at the Kona meeting, uh, LEWG was a little bit concerned about the complexity of the properties mechanism or the complexity of the implications of the properties mechanism. Um, but they did approve the design to move on to wording uh, for C++23. But they decided that C++20 was a little bit too soon. Um, and so because of this, P0, 4, 3 executors had to be delayed um, until early in the 23 cycle. We're actually finding out now that uh, 1194 executors also need properties. Um, so uh, it's kind of a good thing that we were able to at least work through these things together and harmonize things. And weekly teleconferences continue. So earlier reviewers of this talk told me that weekly teleconferences continue is a bad ending. That's why I didn't spoil the ending, because you would have all left. <laughs> and so this is roughly the timeline here. Um, the paper that unifies awaitables and, um, and uh, cinders is not on here. Um, but the, the paper was uh, earlier on in the talk. Um, but I, I certainly wouldn't want to leave off credit for the work, the excellent work that Lewis Baker has done on this. Um, so yeah, I mean, I hope I can come back to you guys at some point with a timeline that actually has things not going off the right. Um, but that's, that's where we're at right now. Um, so what can we learn from all of this? Um, I'm going to try and summarize some of the generic programming takeaways here. But first of all, uh, almost no one needs to be this generic in their code or library API, unless you're writing like Ranges is the closest thing we can think of, and that was ranges for the C++ standard that needed to be this generic, uh, or roughly this, this generic. Um, so the general rule of thumb is be as generic as you need to be, but not more. Um, and uh, hot take, fewer people should be writing generic code than are. Um, so it sounds really weird to say after I've just been through this like long presentation about how all the ins and outs of of uh, generic library design, but um, yeah. So all of the generic programming advice I'm going to give here really applies to library and software that has done a careful assessment of where they need to be 
and where they are in the stack and how generic they need to be. So don't take this as saying you need to write everything in terms of concepts. Um, but to drive home the point, I'm going to talk about non-generic takeaways first. Uh, <laughs> so advice for preparing to use executors. And uh, the most, and this, this is more important than ever. And Sean, uh, you know, Sean Parent drove this home a long time ago. Sean Parent, by the way, has been part of this process off and on. So we we have just to emphasize the the stardom that has been involved in this entire process. Um, it was a real crazy feeling when he turned to me and said, "Well, what do you think about this?" And I'm like, "I don't, I don't know your Sean friggin' Parent. You 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 know better than me." But um, yeah, having We've had some really intelligent people involved in this whole process. Anyway, side story, use algorithms, not loops. And this becomes that much more important because you, you really want to um, be able to, when, when executors come along, you want to be able to delegate the executor integration to lower levels of the stack, right? Um, and and re-implementing the logic of the algorithm itself directly in your, your uh, program precludes the, um, the optimizations that you're going to get for free when executor integration happens on the lower levels of the stack. And uh, use libraries that present restricted programming models. I mean, this whole discussion has been about, um, you know, how restrictive do we need to be uh, in order to be generic over execution model? How restrictive do we need to be to be um, efficient on different forms of execution, right? Um, and so many libraries are tracking the progress of executors in the standard now. For my domain, um, we have HPC libraries like Cocos, HPX, Thrust, Agency. Uh, you know, shameless plug, I work on Cocos. Um, uh, networking, Bustazio has been involved with this process from the beginning. Chris Kohlhoff himself is on every single Friday call and is tracking this process, this progress, very process very carefully. Um, Facebook's Folly library has been uh, involved in this. Eric Niebler is on these calls. So as he extends ranges into asynchronous ranges, these will be um, executor compatible. Um, and so, you know, using ranges, as <laughs> silly as it sounds, which I think everyone, many people intend to anyway, but that is a, is a concrete step you can take to be ready for um, the executor revolution, if you will. Um, Sickle from Codeplay, I should mention them. They've put a lot of work into this, uh, or the Sickle standard um, and the people at Codeplay that work on it, um, which is an extension to C++. And in general, the parallel algorithms in the standard library, which are going to be a, a point that can be customized with executors. So, and apologies to anyone I've forgotten. Um, none of them are in this room, but um, they may be on, out on YouTube. and look down in the comments where somebody's inevitably posted someone I've forgotten. But we, it's been a massive, massive effort. OK, deep breath, uh, generic programming, lessons learned. Um, we really learned to think very carefully about the separation of sem semantically meaningful aspects of your design and uh, semantic agnostic aspects that are nonetheless performance critical. Um, perhaps a different way to say this, or maybe even a better way to say this, is think about the subset of the semantics you need for an algorithm and some sort of property that may represent a superset of those semantics which are performance necessary or which are uh, critical for some other reason. Um, so one example is uh, in early versions of P0443, post and defer were both included, but they were always allowed to do the same thing. You could never rely in your generic algorithm on post doing something different from defer. Um, and we're using up cognitive space by making those things separate. And cognitive space is very valuable territory when you're designing a generic library. Um, so, Aspects external to the semantics or representing a superset of the semantics of the algorithm may still be a performance requirement. Um, and we see this often with the number of things from the standard library that people have rewritten in their own libraries, right? We see this all the time. And we want to try and minimize that going forward. And that's, that's really an important part of this, this whole exercise. Um, 
Properties are an excellent mechanism for expressing these, these, uh, these extra semantic concerns or these uh, semantic supersets. Um, Chris Kohlhoff has actually implemented the entire library bit of, um, of properties in this, in this uh, library called Propria. He's going to, he intends to start using it with Bustazio at some point. Um, he's a masochist, so he went all the way back to C++03 support. So if you're using C++ 98, you are out of luck. Um, and don't pay for what you don't use. So this is like advice that everyone who's done C++ before has um, heard. And, and it's, it's uh, who are, who, anyone who's designed something in C++ has heard. C++ is all about not paying for what you don't use. And in the case of concept-driven design, the, the relevant cost is cognitive load, right? So properties are a way to, to kind of um, separate out some of that cognitive load in a way that can kind of be lopped off for users that don't need it. And subsumption hierarchies, so for, for things that are semantically meaningful, there are, I didn't get time to get into it, but there are some dangerous aspects of just blindly forwarding on properties through an adapter, right? So you, you probably want to use something that is an actual full-blown concept for that. So if you can fit it into a subsumption hierarchy of concepts that will, um, is, is another way of reducing cognitive load, right? Because the user may be able to write their algorithm only thinking about the parent concept. So uh, in conclusion, properties all the things is a little bit too uh, simple. Probably should be something like properties all the semantic agnostic aspects of your design and use carefully crafted subsumption hierarchies of concepts with clear customization points for the rest. Questions? <laughs> all right. Um, yeah. Uh, I have sort of two questions which are a little bit related. You are talking about cognitive load. Yes. And I'm kind of feeling it. <laughs> <laughs> and my, my question is that uh, you are putting in a lot of uh, uh, deeper decisions, decisions and moving parts into this. And uh, how do you feel as you are adding and what is the curve of the perceived complexity? Is it like, I, I'm pretty sure it's not linear. So aren't we, <laughs> aren't we reaching the point where it's too hard? And here comes my other question. There is this adage or, or saying that uh, if you design something, uh, you know, using all your might, then you won't be able to uh, ever tested and this <laughs> kind of parallel and concurrent stuff are, are, are very very hard to test so my question is if it took uh, just to design the interface to birth all experts then we still need to implement this and we will need to test the resulting stuff so so how likely that this is not going to be too big of a work yeah so I, the, basically the question is um how in the world are we ever going to test this stuff and what is the scaling of the complexity um, in this uh, thing, because we clearly have things we still need to add. So maybe it, it may not have come across, but kind of the point, the reason why there's so much complexity in the mechanism itself is to offload complexity from the actual execution model. So you, you need to be able to say, this is something that's not used here, and therefore we need to not test it. Whereas if, if the, the not used part is encoded into the name, it's very difficult to see what parts you're, you're testing and what parts you aren't, right? I don't know if that, that really makes sense uh, or answers your question, but the, part of the reason for all of this complexity within the mechanism and within the interface is to be able to factor out complexity from the concrete uses. Uh, yeah. Not really a question, but maybe a nice remark. Two days ago, there was a new CPP cast episode with Kirk Schuch on HP. Yes. Um, yeah, Kirk, Kirk is, is a, a good friend of mine, and we, we have lots of talks. I get two or three emails from him a week. Um, I have not listened to it yet. Um, and, uh, but, um, I really trust Kurt's opinions on this. He does tend to have, does tend to have absolutist opinions, but they tend to be right. So, 
Um, yeah, that's, I would say recommended listening, absolutely. So the CPP cast episode for the, for the camera, you should, should go look it up with Kirk Shoop in it. S-H-O-O-P. Yeah. What is the final error rating in the training? And do you consider to use error codes? Error codes, that is absolutely error codes were a, see if I can get back there fast enough. <laughs> error codes were a, were a driving use case for the receiver design, right? Because receivers have an error channel that is generic. Um, so did I actually put get value, get, uh, I'm not sure I actually put it on a slide. Oh no, here it is. Set error, right? So in this case, we have a, very simple receiver that is only implementing an error channel that deals with executors. But this can be anything. You can put an integer in here, you can put a string in here. Um, as long as the sender knows how to propagate an error message in that form, this can be anything. And actually, for generic receivers, we, we often want to, or generic receiver adapters, we often want to, um, we often want to propagate any error. So this is often a, a method template. Um, so uh, does that answer your question? Right, so in the, in the generic case, we're actually saying whatever you call an error, we're gonna call it an error also. Alistair, did you have something? Uh, I'm not making you can now tell me how that holds up or not now that coming out the far end of the process, but this was notion that when it comes to writing current code, uh, you often end up using things like the Atomics API, but most of our people who want to write current code shouldn't be down working at that level. That's what was required for the higher level abstraction to be written in terms of. But we had to have that plumbing into the standard. Yes, absolutely. And executors are kind of the same thing for this API is that plumbing for executors. Yes. But the expected user interface is going to be a level of abstraction built on top of this. Rather right. Than everyone coming at the full complex it cognitive burden. Exactly. Yes. So the, the comment was that um, this is kind of the equivalent, the, the notional equivalent of us putting in std atomic into C11 when we didn't really want users to use it, but it was the building block we needed to build things on top of it that users should be using. It was only the very advanced users that should be using atomic. And that's absolutely true. And this is the exact analog of that. And, and to further that point, we actually have several major libraries that are already in, in separate domains that are already building on top of this, that are already using this directly and will be in production before we put anything on top of this into the standard. And that's, I think, really critical here. So I'm three minutes over time, but I am happy to discuss this ad nauseum. Send me an email, send me a tweet. Um, yeah, uh, communicate with me in some way. Um, talk to me at the conference. I, I will talk about this as much as you want me to. So thanks for listening and thanks for coming. And yeah. <laughs>